Making it more real and what's happening in the real world, I like to introduce David De Jaeger of BC Hydro. David is Senior Operations Manager of uh, Smart Metering and Infrastructure, and he was the initiator in BC Hydro, I think already 2006? 2005. 2005, of getting BC Hydro into the smart grid way ahead of the competition. And I'm very happy to have David here and tell us all about how that happened and what they took away and how they keep that competition as a very small car in the rear view mirror. Thanks, I'm gonna use this mic because I do Excellent. have a few notes that I've taken Excellent. Uh, from earlier this morning. So, thank you um, for the overview. Uh, a lot of it is real and I'm gonna talk specifically about how practical it is. So first of all, my name is David Dieger uh, and I come to you from across the Pacific, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Um, and we've got a story to tell, and it's a pretty compelling story, and it's a pretty impressive story when we think about our partnership with Cisco and iTron. And I hope that I can actually answer some of your questions you had about how IoT and IOE fits into your world. But firstly, I have to apologize. I don't have a marketing department behind my slides. It was me. So they might be somewhat boring because it's an electric utility producing these slides, so not a lot of digital media. <laughs> But it's all meat um, and a couple of, a couple of other things. Um, I'll talk about my company. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the, the Linux kernel and the operating system. We've done so much um, with the Cisco system. Um, and and, and for, for those of you in the electrical field, you'll understand this when I talk. I, I actually don't have a slide on it, but I just wanted a reference. We actually have the CGR. Uh, a Cisco connected grid router where we've actually used the guest operating system, the guest OS, where I've got a, a, an application called Grid Director sitting on the edge making controlled decisions for a voltage regulator. We've sent event thresholds in this Linux kernel so it knows once I see that threshold exceeded, I'm going to make a near real time decision to, to change a tap changer in my substation, do something locally. So that traffic doesn't have to come back to the head-end system because it takes time. There's not enough latency in the world for us to have real-time edge computing, so I'm glad you mentioned it. I was going to ask if you did to, to, to pick on you. And secondly, you did mention use cases. I don't have a slide on use cases. I started this program um, back in 2005, and there was already a really excellent set of use cases out there for all of us to use. Southern California Edison. San Diego Gas and Electric. All of the companies across North America who were embarking on the smart grid journey had developed some use cases. SoCal led, thought so highly of them, they put a patent process on those use cases. But we were in there before the patent process and we took, took those set of use cases and we expanded them. And that was my job back in 2005. And I went around our entire company to BC Hydro and I said, imagine if you had unencumbered access to a grid unencumbered access to smart, intelligent data from meters, what would you do with it? And I had this taxonomy, I had 140 processes, and I built those use cases into this, this new set of use cases. So I have gone from meter to cash. I don't care about billing, that's, that's old school. I mean, I, I care about it, it's my cash register. But you'll see, I've gone from meter to cash to meter to grid to the evolution of these use cases. So let me tell you a bit about my story. So firstly, um, let, me, let me thank you for, um, for hosting me here. Um, I think we've got a lot to talk about. Um, amongst all of the electric utilities, I think we all have a role to play in this. And our role to play is when you start to talk about the internet of everything in your company, and as we start talking amongst ourselves, let's make sure that there's standardization across this Internet of Things, standardization across the Internet of Everything. Because if we don't do that, there's no value add for the end consumer. Right? We're going to have all these disparate technologies having to have different interfaces. So think about that when you're deploying your smart grid of the future, how to standardize that. So let me get it into um, my slide deck. So, um, so a little bit about BC Hydro. Uh, we're a vertically integrated company. We generate electricity, we transmit electricity, and we distribute the electricity. 
Um, you probably can't see a lot of, a lot of this right now. Um, we're, 95% of the electricity we produce in, B, in BC is by water. Um, it's all hydroelectric. 95% is by hydroelectric. And one of the constraints for us is, you probably can't see it that well, most of the hydroelectricity is produced in the northern part of the province and the eastern part of the province. Up here and here, right? So 11,000 megawatts of power produced up here. However, most of my customers are down in the lower southwest quadrant. So we have to transmit all of that power down to where most of the, con uh, where the consumption is happening. So we have to think about line loss losses, transmission line losses and distribution line losses. And whatever excess power we have, we can sell it to the neighbors to the south of us and to the east of us. Um, so I've got about 900,000 poles, 18,000 kilometers of transmission lines, 12,000 megawatts of power, uh, 300 substations. And this is British Columbia, 365,000 square miles or, or 765,000 square kilometers. And these two million customers we have, not only are they located down in the lower mainland, they're all over the entire province. And so you can understand a very large and diverse geography has with it both opportunities and constraints. And we realize that not a single network provider covered the entire province. So my challenge was to actually deploy smart meters across our entire service territory with one network. So here's a question we all ask ourselves, and I think um, Cisco did, has done a great job of recognizing that today. Um, so you know, what are we all facing as electric utilities? Well, as you saw from what Toshiba is doing and, and, and what Cisco talks about, consumers expect a lot more of us. When you think about the applications of the devices, of the technologies they're using today, these are called disruptive technologies. Look it up on Wiki, what is disruptive technologies? We're seeing technologies that are asking more than what the electric system could support, right? Again, Edison, if you could look, if you'd had a conversation with us today, he says, I recognize those porcelain insulators. I recognize those aluminum conductors. Well, we have to take that, take that mindset away from ourselves and talk about digitizing the electric system because my goal is to make sure the packets can meet the electrons because the consumers are expecting so much more from us. You know, here's some, here's some examples. All of the different connected consumer electronics, you want to be able to plug it in, you want to make it affordable, reliable, available at all costs. Customer self-generation, we see a lot of that, even up in British Columbia. Wind, tidal, some solar. Right? So we've got net metering to support that, but can the grid support that? Electric vehicle, we're looking at the, the electrification of the transportation system. I'm not sure how much is happening over here in Singapore, but in Vancouver, you, you can go anywhere, you can see charging stations, you see electric vehicles. Even though our rates are so low, my rates are seven and a half cents a kilowatt hour, eight cents a kilowatt hour, it's attractive to go and get that electric vehicle because I'm paying a dollar fifty a liter for gasoline. Man, if I can actually have an electric vehicle, how, how awarding is that? But at the same time, think about the constraints on the electric um, system that we have to support and all the pending disruptive technologies coming today and for the next 20 years. So, so why, so what? So what, this is our answer to how are we gonna meet those customer challenges? And this is, a, this is just a snippet from the web. We're, we're featured on, on different news articles, different technology um, um, forums. So our answer was to open up the grid with IPv6. Open up the grid with IPv6. Four simple little alphanumeric characters. IPv6. Pretty simple. Until you really start to uncover it. It's, um, it adds so much value. And I'm going to talk about the value it adds to both the utility and the customers. I'm going to talk about why we decided to go with IPv6. Um, so, so again, what, what our program was about, we're going to roll out 2 million meters across the province of BC. So we purchased the meters from ITRON. And we formed a partnership with ITRON and Cisco. And we're actually going to roll out the meters. We're going to build out the network. And then we're going to transition it over to IPv6. And if you don't know about IPv6, I've got some smart friends at Cisco will be able to spend as much time as you want talking about that protocol. But we all understand 
we ran out of IPv4 addresses a couple of years ago. IPv4 took us so far. IPv6, that standardized IPv6, can do so much more for us as electric utilities, and it was exciting for us. Although it wasn't developed when we started the program, when we first deployed our first set of meters, Cisco was still working on the stack. ITRON had just finished manufacturing a brand new meter for us. They had to build more memory, more processing power. I'll talk, I'm going to actually give you a picture of what we've done um, with the meters out of South Carolina, or North Carolina, I'm going to Carolina, yes. South Carolina, and what Cisco down to the south in California were doing for us actually to deliver to us this simple four letter alphanumeric acronym, IPv6. Today, um, I've got about 500,000 of our meters transitioned over to IPv6 out of the 2 million meters deployed. It's, it's a daunting task. It's not for the faint of heart, but it brings an enormous amount of value to you, and I'm going to talk about some of those values. Again, we're in a bit of a transitory state right now. Um, when we first rolled out the ITRON network, it was the traditional RF LAN, and you've seen Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric, Detroit Edison. Um, they had what was called RF LAN, the traditional uh, mesh network, 900 meg mesh network. But that brings a whole host of values. Like, I mean, honestly, like even when we rolled out RF LAN, we were seeing some tremendous benefits in automated billing, uh, timely, timely information to the consumers. We allowed our consumers to have in-home display devices and in-home feedback on a web portal. We got all, all, all of that out of the, IP, or out of the RF LAN network. Um, outage detection, so as soon as we have these large power outages in the province of BC, we have major snowstorms and windstorms and rainstorms. They knock the power out. These meters send us power outage notifications, and then they send us these power restoration notifications. You get all that with the base product. But then we said, well, let's take a glimpse into the future. Let's take that look and let's actually form this partnership. I want to talk about embedded intelligence. I want to talk about distribution automation. I want to grab any one of your partners out there, Cisco and ITRON, any technology vendor, I'm going to drop it in. And I want to make sure it works. I want to be able to drop it in and not having to build a second set of networks to enable to support the distribution automation. And we call this the multi-service grid network multi-service grid network, and you'll hear me refer to MSGN. We tagged that a couple of years ago in BC Hydro when we said, well, IPv6 is kind of meaningless when I'm talking to my executive. I got to call it something different, so what do we want to do with it? Well, I wanted to have, I want to talk about this being the meter to grid network. So let's call it a multi-service grid network. So what is the first main ingredient? I've got a recipe for success. My first main ingredient is the smart meter. It's made in one of the Carolinas by my friends at Ditron. It's kind of a cool product. It's, um, again, this is, the, this is the latest version, the latest hardware version. It's called 3.7. More processing power, more memory. It's got a disconnect switch. It's got the 2.4 gig Zigbee radio. Um, again, we've got a lot of con uh, consumers in our service territory that want the in-home display devices. It's got tremendous instrumentation profile. So that means instantaneous voltage, high voltage, low voltage, power quality data, as well as load profile data, interval, just base interval data. You know, your, your kilowatt hours per hour, your watt hours per watt hour, your, your, your VAR H. It already had that, but then we wanted instrumentation profile. This, it can even detect if somebody's tampered, if somebody's put meters, or sorry, um, magnets on my meter, it slows the digital meter down. Don't try this at home because I will find you. <laughs> they actually built in mag tamper detection into their meter. Fantastic product. Then came along my friends at Cisco. Itron says, here's a radio, Cisco. What can you do with it? Can you make a Ferrari out of this meter? Absolutely, they said. We'll own the network component. We'll own the network layer. We'll help you build IPv6 on top of that network layer, on top of that comms card. And they did it. They actually purchased a company called Archrock some very intelligent people who understand the world of IP, and they've built the IPv stack for the, um, for the industry today. So that's the first ingredient to success, the smart meter. The second most important ingredient, this little thing called the CGR, the Connected Grid Router. Utility grade, you'll see a copy. I think, um, I think my friend Paul at the back is gonna talk about the uh, CGR. 
I'm going to show you some examples of what they're doing with the CGR and the meters. Talk about power line carry, that's awesome. Can't wait till it comes to North America. Um, utility grade, if you ever want, if you want to watch a cool video, watch man versus a CGR. They drop it in water, they kick it, they scratch it, they, they beat that crap out of it and it still keeps on ticking. It's a really cool video. Um, so it communicates with our meters uh, over the, um, either the RFLAN or the IPv6 network. And then we'll backhaul that data using over five different mediums. WiMAX, two different carriers, two satellites, even the internet service provider. Again, we've got this huge province I've got to cover, and so we use multiple backhaul technologies to bring that data back into BC Hydro. And uh, because we want to withstand those storms I told you about in BC, we have major storms from November to February, a lot like what I saw here a couple of days ago when I got totally drenched with rain. That was something. Um, we have to withstand the storm so they've got eight hours of battery backup just so we can make sure we can get those messages out there and back in and make sure our crews can get there in time to actually keep the system up. I've got eight hours. It's, um, you know, some cases we won't be able to achieve success. You know, we'll, we might be out for a complete day, but for the most part, we should be able to get us through to withstand those significant um, system disturbances. So, I've got the smart meter was ingredient one. I've got the router, ingredient two. Give it a little stir, put it in the oven for about 45 minutes, take it out. My multi-service grid network. Again, I've got a few applications. Actually, if I showed you my application diagram, I'd fill up the whole back wall because we had to think about security. I had to think about redundancy. I had to think about um, disaster recovery. Um, and so we actually built this SNI, the secure network infrastructure, to, to add all that. So again, you take the meter, the router, a few applications, Put it for 45 minutes, take it out, and you've got a multi-service grid network. So let's take a slice out of this and see what this looks like. Take a slice out of this multi-service grid network and see what it brings aside from being able to bill your customers because that's what we love to do. So the first thing you'll notice is one of the differentiators is this thing called quality of service, QoS, right? And so the example I'll give here is, again, we're going through a major storm in the province of BC. I've got a bunch of meters sending me power outage notifications and power restoration notices as the power is restored. I've got a restoration center. I've got a bunch of operators sitting in a control room, and they're trying to ping my meters to see which customers still have power and which ones don't have power. And at the same time, because I'm putting distribution automation devices into my network, they're also operating at the same time. So what quality of service does, it actually provides a pecking order it provides a pecking order for each of these different, different types of events or exceptions. And so here I'm saying, my operator is trying to ping the meter. You guys get, you're the last resort. I want to make sure ahead of you is my outage notifications and my restoration notifications. And at the top of that pecking order is my distribution automation devices. I want to make sure that my reclosures are closing in and my operators know about it. I want to know my the DA devices are keeping that network alive. This is the highest priority for me. So that's a quality of service that the Cisco IPv6 stack and the way Ripple works, the way uh, port, the port sensing actually works or QoS within the device and the application. This is one of the first uh, key differentiators. So this is not hypothetical. This is real. So what I've done here is I've taken some examples of where I've deployed the mesh and then I transitioned it to IPv6. So what, is this, what, is some of this other, what are some of the subtle differences? So the first graph you'll see is this is the hop count on RF LAN. And what that means is this means how many hops do I have to go to before I can see the router? So I might be talking to you who talks to you who talks to you, talks to you. That's five hops before I can see the router. And every time you hop through a node, it's, it's, it's going to be 250 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds, 500, depending on how you've actually built your, built your network out. It adds latency. So what Cisco did when they looked at the Ripple stack, when they looked at the standard, they said, our network has to be a flatter, a lower latent network, has to be a smarter network. I've always got to constantly look for my best path out, always. And I'm going to show you a really cool video of that. So this is a case where before I transitioned to IPv6, only 30% of my meters are within two hops. Then I transitioned to IPv6, those same cells, 
60% of my meters are now within two hops. So now I think about it. I'm a, I'm a distribution planner. I can take my DA device, close my eyes, drop it in, and I've got a far greater success in making sure that DA device gets out to my network. Second thing that's, more, that's very important for us is how latent is your network? How fast is it? So before IPv6, I was looking at and comparing node to node latency, meter to meter, meter to range extender, range extender to router, meter to router. And on average, it was about 1.7 seconds before IPv6, 1.7 seconds before, before IPv6. I transitioned those same cells that we saw earlier over to IPv6. Now look at the difference. 250, 260, 270 seconds, sorry, milliseconds between network nodes. A flatter mesh and a quicker mesh. Now my distribution engineers, now my distribution planners can talk to me. Now they're loving me. At first they're going, it's all theoretical. Not anymore. This is a cool slide. So what we've done, what we've done is um, we actually modeled, we actually took a real video. It's a logical model of those cells that I just talked about. And we wanted to see what, is, what are these meters doing? What are these endpoints? What are these network nodes doing? And, and, and as you can see, they're constantly searching out for that better path in order to be a smart grid, in order to be a multi-service grid network. What you'll see is, and I'm going to take one of the routers away. What happens if I take one of my routers away? And so this is, these are the cells, the logical cells, and as you can see, they're constantly searching for that better path to make it a multi-service grid network. Um, and, um, yes, the boxes are the purple one. And what you'll see is we're going to take one of them away here in a minute, and you'll be able to see how resilient the network is. We're going to shock it, and it's going to go, I lost my father. Where are you, Dad? There it is. Dad, where'd you go? Where'd you go? And it starts to think, it starts to form its registration, and poof, it finds its next, next bad path. It, it reminds me of, uh, you know, you know I tried to explain this to my wife when I was building the presentation. It's kind of like a bunch of kids going from, from house to house in the neighborhood looking for the best party, and all of a sudden one of the parents decides to, you know, shut the lights off, lock the door, and the kids go out. They, they will find that next best party in the neighborhood. <laughs> they really will. Um, so that was meters, but how about the DA devices? So working closely with Cisco and our reclosure um, uh, technology partner in ITRON on, uh, on, on testing a reclosure. Um, and what we want to do is be able to drop that reclosure into our network. Um, and again, one of the issues for us in BC Hydro was the fact that I've got 365,000 square miles of service territory with either limited or zero communications for a lot of these reclosures. So we had to have some internal programming logic in our reclosers, right? So three seconds off, flash on. Four seconds off, flash on. Five seconds off, and if, and, and if nothing happens, then I'm gonna stay off. So then it required us to manually intervene. I had to roll the truck to go and close back in these reclosers. My control center operator didn't, what, didn't know what was going on in the network on these reclosures, right? Because I didn't have network. But by the time I've deployed two million meters across the service territory, I'm providing them with this multi-service grid network so I can actually start to automate these reclosures. So now my control center operators know about the health of the system, the status of my grid. And if I get one of my field staff to phone me to say, the branch is off the line, the line's back up, well then I can control, my operator can, can actually close back in that recloser. Again, a fantastic set of use cases for us. Um, is it real? Well, here it is. I've got a research and development lab, and we work closely with our friends at Cisco and ITRON in developing the next version of, um, of the operating system. So here what you can see is I've actually got my reclosers, serial connected to a, a DA, the IR500 at the time, soon to be IR509 for us. Um, I've got the latest version of the network management system, and we're actually using a version of CGIOX, which is not publicly available yet. Again, we like to test this before we actually get, you know, Cisco actually puts this into production. This is in the lab. Uh, within the next couple of weeks, we're actually going to put this out into production um, out in BC Hydro as one of our uh, actual production sites. 
uh, in the lower mainland in Vancouver. And not only did we build out a smart, uh, a smart grid laboratory, we've also got a, a smart meter farm. So I've got hundreds of uh, test smart meters out in, uh, out in the field as well as uh, the CGRs and the network management system so we can actually really test this, test it hard before we actually get back into full production. And one thing we actually did, a lot of people will ask us, how secure is this? You know, we were thinking about all the vulnerabilities. Well, we hired a company out of the um, South US called SWERI, the Southwest Research Institute. They're ethical hackers. So we, we gave them a lot of money for a long time, and then we said, try to, try to find some vulnerabilities. Try to hack into this system. They had some process issues with us. I mean, they found a couple of steps along the way. They said, well, actually, we think the sequence of event for logging to your SEM um, probably is out of order a bit. That was a simple <coughs> fix for us. And so we worked hard with Cisco and I trying to develop these standard operating procedures for our logs and event monitoring. Um, a very secure, very robust system. Um, so when you think about the Internet of Things, and you talked about it, the Internet of Things was people, process, technology, and data, bringing it all together. So here's an example of where we brought the Internet of Things together and one of the, um, an issue for customers. Last August, um, and this is, we, we see about five of these examples every week. Shame on us, but we're just realizing the, how powerful the data is. So we realized that we actually saw an increase in voltage in about August the, uh, August the 30th last year, a pretty significant increase on one of our feeders serving about 230 customers. And so I've got a meter data management system. We actually set voltage alarms in our meters. So whenever there's a voltage alarm, it notifies us. We're going to expose that to our distribution management system. But right now, this was uh, just one of my load research analysts who works for me noticed this significant voltage across this feeder from the meter data. He sends the data to a distribution engineer who starts to investigate it. At the same time, while we're investigating, a customer phones in complaining about his inverter was shutting down. So we actually, he sent an electrician out to the site and they found that there was an issue with the voltage. But we already knew about that. And what we actually discovered, that on our voltage regulator, on the BC, can you believe it? On the BC Hydro system, our voltage regulator had the wrong setting. Right? Shame on us. And what we're finding is in between some of our maintenance cycles, we don't have the settings quite correct because we never had sensors on our system. Now, I've got two million sensors across my entire system. So again, there's customer benefits there. This is not the, like, honestly, it's not for me. It's for you, the consumer. When I talked about those disruptive technologies and the fact you want unencumbered access to reliable power, I'll give you that once I know what's going on in my system. <laughs> So two slides before I close. Um, having a smarter grid, not a smart grid, but you know, I, I, you ask an engineer, or you tell an engineer that we're embarking on a smart grid, they'll give you a whack up the head. You think I built a dumb grid, right? This is a smarter grid. Um, but having a smarter grid, one's a, one that affords us greater visibility across the entire network, it's going, to allow us, it's going to allow us to fully understand what is happening on our system at any point in time. Again, good for us as a utility, right? great for the customer. And I always like to close with this. If, I'm not sure if you've seen the movie A Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner. If you build it, they will come. If you build that smart grid, my distribution planners, my distribution engineers, my power system engineers, those tax savvy, those, sorry, those, those techno, technology savvy vendors like Cisco and iTron, They'll come, and your customers will come, and your customers will thank you for it. Thank you. There are questions. Oh, no. I, I, wa I wanted to check, yeah. Did somebody get eager? They did three questions in one. Oh, okay. Excellent. <laughs> thank you, Ronnie. No, whoever. <laughs> are, we, are we putting them on screen, or have, do I need to do something? Ah, there they are. David, back to you. Sure. Okay. Um, let, let me let me answer question number two, and I apologize. I never talked about the scale and scope of our program. Um, and I know this is going to be a little bit uh, eyes wide open for some of you, but we spent nine hundred and thirty million dollars on our program. But we had a significant problem with the theft of electricity. 
So although we're going to spend that kind of money, we're, we get $1.6 billion of benefits back, a net positive benefit to our utility. The customers don't pay a dime unless you opt out, unless you opt out. Um, Before you go on, tell them what they were growing. <laughs> BC is a very green economy. <laughs> There's a lot of marijuana grown in the province of BC because we, we supply a lot of it to our friends in California. <laughs> so uh, power diversion was a, uh, was, was a large issue for us. And what we're doing is we're actually putting uh, meters on transformers and feeders and we're aggregating the smart meter data. And we've got a very intelligent energy analytics system that tells us where there are losses non-technical losses, and we've accounted for the technical losses. So again, a big business case driver for us. One of the biggest challenges facing us, again, most, I think the, the greatest challenge was, you know, I'm not sure if any of you have ever been to Vancouver, but it reminds me of Singapore. We've got a lot of large high rises in downtown Vancouver. I've got a very dense urban um, city. Then I've got some suburban. I've got some rural and very, very, very remote parts of the province. I've got some guys way in the middle of nowhere. So our greatest challenge was reaching 99% of the customers with one network. Again, when you think about what we're doing in order to achieve conservation, we're putting in low E glass in all of our high rises. Radio frequency doesn't propagate out of those buildings. So we, we were ingenious. We started to cable in range extenders into the parkades. And I know I'm talking, to, I'm stopping off at China Light and Power on Friday. They've got the same issue, so we're going to exchange those types of stories. We're getting there, but it's through the innovations of some of our telecommunications engineers. Are we getting there? So that was probably our, our greatest challenge. Um, how did we handle the meter readers? Our meter readers were outsourced. Uh, to Accenture, so we just outsourced. We paid them to read all of our meters for us. So for us, it was commercial terms uh, with the uh, with the outsource agency in terms of the um, the meter reader impacted. Can I ask with the net benefit that you talked about from introducing smart meters, was that net benefit then used to fund further innovations within BC Hydro, or was it used to reduce tariff to the customers of how did you right. sell that benefit to the citizens in the first place? Well, part of it was to offset the cost for us to deploy a multi-service grid network. I could have deployed it for $350 million and it would have been a meter to cash, right, and claimed a smaller amount of benefit, and then I would have had to go back to my regulator and ask money to be a smart grid. But we said, let's do it all at once, right? So let's offset the cost of that with these benefits. And secondly, if you look at our business case, my, our business case is published online. Um, www.bchydro.com smart metering, you'll see a significant number of operational benefits, some distribution automation, some customer benefits. So um, if you have any questions about our business case, please, if I can't provide it to you, look at our, look at our business case online. Uh, which field does Cisco join to your solution? Which field does Cisco join to your solution? Uh, make sure, to, are you talking about the field area network or this advanced services versus BU? Um, maybe, maybe you're talking about, is it, do we just provide the technology or do we get some services? Is it, do we help operate it? Well, they don't, they don't help operate it, but they do all of the above. So they help to develop the the technology. Um, they actually, their advanced services and business units spent a lot of time up in BC. Um, but then again, remember, they actually built that, that complete network layer that sits on, uh, on the ITRON meter. Um, so they provide the field area network. So when I say I'm transitioning to IPv6, it's their stack I'm transitioning to. Um, so we, um, again, we have uh, unencumbered access to the smartest minds in Cisco, I think. Except for you. I haven't talked to you, but now I do. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, if there's no more questions, I think we're good. thank you. Thank you.